and welcome to RSNA 2021. My name is Brian Casey, Editor-in-Chief of AmpMini.com. We're here today with Dr. Paul Chang. He is Professor and Vice Chair of Radiology at the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Chang uh, is uh, gracious enough to talk to us every year at RSNA about artificial intelligence and, and kind of what's the latest going on there. Uh, obviously, we didn't make it last year, but um, we're, we're glad to pick up the, the tradition this year. Dr. Chang, thanks for being with us. Well, thanks for inviting me, Brian. Now, what are, what are some of the trends that you see in artificial intelligence? It's been a couple years since we talked, so right. uh, a couple years is, is an eternity in <laughs> the, the world of AI. What are some of the things that you see have happened over the last couple of years? Well, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. We're, we're kind of in an interesting time right now with respect to AI and radiology. We're certainly past all the hype and irrational panic and over exuberant optimism, right? And as we discussed in our past uh, uh, discussions, um, we're, we're, we're definitely past the initial hype and over-promising of the Gartner hype cycle. We're kind of in that area that's always inevitable and always predictable, and that is that trough of disillusionment. Mm -hmm. And that shouldn't, be a, that shouldn't be a downer or a, or a pessimistic view. I mean, it's inevitable. Every sort of uh, the potentially disruptive technology goes through this phase where we over-promise, under-deliver, and then we kind of get disillusioned because mm -hmm. we're impatient and we're fanboys, yep. uh, but we just lack for multiple reasons we can get into in a bit. We don't have the wherewithal to appropriately consume the disruptive technology. We've gone through this for everything, whether it be packs, speech recognition, big data, AI is no different. And then we eventually get there, right, to mm -hmm. appropriately consume. What I find that's interesting now as I travel around looking at the ex technical exhibits and also the scientific sessions, we're kind of at an inflection point here. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, it's inevitable that we're going to have to go through this trough of disillusionment. The question though is, is it going to be prolonged? In other words, is this going to be really take, it, will it take a long time to get us through that to appropriate consumption? Or is there any way we can accelerate that? Because as you know, and we've stated this before, uh, we need some help, right? Radiology, we're just barely hanging on with our existing systems. And, and we're hoping, many of us, myself included, that AI can help be enabling technology to help us get through the demands now and our future demands for radiology services to our patients and referring physicians. The, the evidence that suggests we're kind of at this inflection point is classic, right? We yep. see a lot of venture capital investment. We see a lot of companies. But to be truthful, People aren't, free, they're not willing to share freely this information, but your, your sense is when you talk to folks, vendors as well as customers, the revenue realization by these companies is actually pretty modest right, right now. Right. And, that's, and, and again, that should not be discouraging, that's predictable. And it's a classic example when you're in that trough of disillusionment. Um, and, and, and so again, the question is, if we're in this point of inflection, what can we do to, to, to prevent this prolongation and get quicker to something that we need. I think there are three major drivers that, that I observed. And again, I apologize for people who've listened to my rants in the past because <laughs> it'll be the same. But I have to say this last two years have just, just basically emphasized, I think, the validity of those three perspectives. Yeah, yeah. I think number one, as we've always talked about, is we have to move use cases from just nice to haves to must haves, use cases that move the needle you know, improve efficiency, quality, reduce variability. Now it's understandable in the beginning, the use cases of AI and radiology were driven more by data availability than compelling use case. Yes, that's yeah. just the nature of the beast. We're past that now. We're past feasibility studies. In fact, one of the criticisms I would lay against uh, 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 we in academia is we've got to stop just doing these feasibility studies now. We really now have to really do studies that are harder, don't get me wrong, and take time to actually demonstrate real world generalizability and impact that matter. We need to do that. Mm. Because right now, when I look around, the use cases are still nice to have. They're not ones that say, I gotta get this, right? Yeah. Um, now, I think one of the things you're beginning to see, which is healthy, is people are beginning to see that the potential benefit of AI application radiology is probably better in upstream processes. You know, when you mm -hmm. look at industrial engineering, you see upstream and downstream processes. And while it's true, the value that most processes are are at the end, the downstream. So in the case of radiology, the value is my interpretation that hopefully can impact positively the care of our patients. It is the upstream processes before the images get to me in the reading room on my workstation that have the greatest impact with respect to efficiency, variability, and quality. And you're beginning to see people apply AI to that. Now it's not as flashy or sexy, right? It's not as sexy as saying, this, this AI algorithm outperforms radiologists. 
but is potentially, I believe, much more impactful with respect to improving what we do in a meaningful, measurable, real-world way. Mm -hmm. So I think this emphasis or this, this pivoting to upstream processes and the application of AI to those upstream processes is a positive thing. These are things like data reconstruction, algorithms. Exactly, like improve yeah. infection, but it goes beyond that. Again, as we said before in the last rant two years ago, we, we, we have to be polymorphic and polycapable. We should not have just a imaging convolutional neural network bias when it comes to the application of AI and radiology. The application of NLP and other kinds of approaches in AI, especially with respect to its application in upstream processes, can be very impactful. It's not just reconstruction, it can also be helping in decision support in ordering, protocoling, uh, error correction, all these kinds of things. And downstream with respect to identification of incidental findings so it can be automated and less variable. So I think this idea of going just beyond what goes on in the reading room, just going beyond what the radiologist does to improve uh, all upstream and downstream processes by AI is a, is a positive thing. I think the second driver is is one that you're seeing now, you're beginning to see a number of articles that superficially look very discouraging for AI. Mm -hmm. And that is, the real world performance isn't close to or is not as, as high performing as what was promised. Mm -hmm. Now, people are looking at the naysayers saying, you see, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not true. It's not the fault of AI. It's the fault of how we're using AI. You know, as yeah, we mentioned yeah. before, AI is a, is a data intensive statistical methodology. And so the rules of st statistics apply. Yeah, There's nothing yeah. fancy about it, it's there. And so the idea of taking an AI algorithm, testing it, and then assuming, okay, it's static, you can use it, general, generalizable in the clinical setting, that's a naive perspective. And we all knew that, yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah. And so it is understandable and inevitable and predictable that you're starting to see papers that say, hey, in real world, it's not working as well as was promised. Mm -hmm. Again, that's not the fault of AI, it's the fault of the relative primitive way we're using AI. So I think the second driver that's going to help us reduce this trough of disillusionment and get to appropriate consumption is we need to really do the boring but important work of being improving drastically how we integrate AI into our production workflow. We cannot just simply view AI algorithms as a static thing I buy, forget, and it's going to work. Gotcha. It has to be continuously evolving. It has to be continuously learning, which means we're going to have to figure out a way either synchronously, asynchronously, real time or batch, leverage our experience of AI in the real world and continuously feed those algorithms. Now, the problem with that is that's hard. You know, it's, it's easy to say, oh, I'm gonna buy that algorithm, let's throw it in, my PAX vendor has a, a, a app store that will allow me to integrate it. It's easy for everyone, for mm -hmm. industry to do it. The problem is these systems are statistical models that require continuous feeding and care, yep. which means we're gonna to have to go beyond simply, oh, let's buy this algorithm and deploy it. It's gonna be, we're gonna to have to have a much more sophisticated infrastructure that not only consumes the algorithm, but also how do we maintain it by leveraging our data. But that's hard, that's really yeah, challenging. Yeah, yeah. And it's gonna require much deeper cooperation amongst multiple players. It's no longer a startup with an AI algorithm. It's, that, yeah, yeah. it's cooperation with a PAX vendor, EMR vendor, more interoperability than we have right now. And that leads me to the final thing that it needs to drive. I think we're never gonna leverage AI unless we fundamentally redesign, you know, the theme of this, uh, this whole conference is redesigning and re-engineering radiology. We're gonna have to redesign our systems, whether it be our PAX, speech recognition, EMRs, in fact. We're gonna to have to drastically change how AI is consumed by our PAX vendors. Right now, to be quite honest, the PAX vendors are trying to control the narrative of AI. AI is a peripheral to the PAX. Well, we'll meet you kind of in parallel. We'll meet you in the work list maybe, or some screenshots in DICOM. That's not going to work to fully leverage a thing. We're gonna to have to have a complete different kind of PAX architecture where, it apply, where AI is seamlessly integrated real time not, not, not asynchronously. And it really is going to be necessary to not think just in terms of capability, like tools like AI, but rather thinking, what are we trying to do? Well, what we're trying to do is optimize a data-driven, contextually aware, optimized human-machine collaborative workflow orchestration, where AI is going to be critically important. But 
that will be something I think that's absolutely critical. As I see now, AI is being very constrained by the limitations of the legacy PAC systems we have. It's going to require much deeper and more sophisticated cooperation between multiple, amongst multiple players, the PACS vendors, EMR vendors, um, IT, as well as AI to make this real. Yeah. If we do this, you know, and so even though, you know, the papers seem a little discouraging, revenue re realization is a little modest, totally predictable. I'm not discouraged, I'm still a long-term optimist, but we're gonna to have to start doing the non-sexy but important yep, yep. hard work to make it real. The hard work, good. Well, Dr. Okay. Chang, thanks so much for being with us again. Some great sure. thoughts. Okay, great. Take care. Signing off for AntMini.com, my name is Brian Casey.